Welcome everyone to today's uh, Glyconet ACS joint webinar. Uh, my name is Warren Walkercheck and I'm the scientific director of Glyconet. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Chantal Capacciotti, who's an assistant professor at Queen's University, which is in Ontario. Uh, Chantal actually represents uh, a second generation network investigator. Uh, she did her PhD with uh, Robert Ben, who uh, is uh, also a network investigator. So it's nice to see that uh, trainees are making their way into the ranks of network investigators. This is fantastic. Uh, so Chantel did her PhD with, with uh, Professor Ben at the University of Ottawa and then moved on to a postdoctoral fellow with Gert Jan Boons, who spoke here a couple of weeks ago uh, at the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center in Georgia. Um, where she spent some time developing some very cool chemo, uh, chemoenzymatic strategies for the synthesis of glycans. Um, I, I met Chantel when she actually interviewed for a faculty position at, uh, at Ryerson University, so I got a chance to know about her work uh, in quite some detail during that interview process. Um, and fortunately, I think for her, she managed to land a position at Queen's University where she's a currently an assistant professor and a Queen's National Scholar in Precision Molecular Medicine, which is a joint appointment between the departments of chemistry and, and biomedical and molecular sciences. And Chantelle is gonna tell us about some of her really exciting work, at least ex very exciting from my perspective because we do kind of similar things. Um, so I'm lo really looking forward to your your presentation, Chantal. Great, thank you for the introduction, Warren, and, and for the, the flashback of remembering what it was like to interview for faculty positions about two, just, just over two years ago now. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity to speak at Glyconet uh, through the seminar series again. Um, this will, I guess, be my kind of second talk. Uh, first with more uh, recent work that we've been doing in my group since establishing at Queen's. Um, I will start off by saying um, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about now is kind of preliminary proof of concept work that we've been working towards. And so I'm really excited to hear feedback and questions and comments and suggestions with some of the, the work that we have going on. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some of the strategies that we've been using to help develop chemical tools um, and use a glycan remodeling strategy to try to probe and capture glycan protein interactions. And so I'm sure that um, many uh, of everyone in the, the, oh, sorry, in this current audience uh, is familiar with, um, we're interested in the sugars that are found that kind of coat the surface of cells uh, called the glycocalyx. So it's kind of this dense, thick coating of sugar that surrounds virtually every um, cell type um, and this glycocalyx uh, has a wide range of bi biological functions. Um, it's critical for facilitating cell-cell recognition and adhesion events. Um, it's important for cell signaling and communications. The glycocalyx and the glycans found within there um, are implicated in a wide range of physiological processes as well as disease processes, um, including inflammation, immune response, pathogen recognition. Um, the list can kind of go on and on as to kind of the importance of the sugars found in the glycocalyx. Now, um, primarily kind of in, in, in my group where we started to kind of focus um, on, on certain types of glycans, uh, uh, certain classes of glycans, we're primarily interested in human or mammalian type glycans. And so if we're kind of looking at uh, a, a cartoon representation of, of what a mammalian cell service or human cell service would look like, um, again, as I'm sure many of you are, are, are aware of, um, the, the glycans that are found in cell surfaces or on the glycocalyx are quite heterogeneous and very diverse. Many of these are conjugated um, to proteins and they're glycoproteins or they're conjugated to lipids as glycolipids. And these structures of glycans can kind of range from long linear structures, for instance, heparin sulfates, um, where they're long linear chains that can be further diversified uh, and made more kind of complicated and complex by adding uh, sulfate groups, carboxylate groups, amines, uh, N-acetyl groups, for instance. 
Um, but to kind of make the, the picture a bit more complex, there's various other classes and structures of glycans, many of which um, are also branch structures, primarily um, the ones that we're interested in and that we kind of focus on in my group are N-glycans and O-glycans, which both of these can be branch structures. Um, N-glycans being nitrogen linked to asparagine residues. There's a common pentasaccharide core associated with N-glycans. Um, and O-glycans, which are oxygen linked typically through serine or threonine molecules. So um, I just kind of like to give this general snapshot overview just because it's, uh, it, it's nice to kind of highlight the heterogeneity and diversity of glycans, which makes studying uh, cell surface glycans in particular really challenging to do. And this is also kind of compounded by the fact that while we have this uh, diversity in types of structures or classes of glycans that are found on cell surfaces, we also get kind of an added layer of complexity in that um, at particular glycosylation sites, we don't have a single glycoform. We often can have potentially uh, various different glycoforms. So I'm just kind of using a general example here to outline this um, for this, say, N-glycan. It is, um, uh, there may be, say, this particular structure that I've attached to this um, asparagine residue here, but in all practicality, it's highly heterogeneous because N-glycans can be heterogeneous in general. So they can be biantenary with two branches, triantenary with three branches, or even up to tetraantenary. And each of these structures can have different epitopes on the branching points, which means that at this particular asparagine residue, there could be various different structures attached to that residue, um, along with at different kind of amino acid positions that are typically glycosylated. So this kind of adds another layer of complexity um, within glycoforms itself and different uh, classes of glycans that makes it really difficult to try to understand the biological roles of glycans. And so while we kind of have an idea, well, we know that, um, that glycans are complex and that they're critical for a lot of biology, we have um, a, a little bit less of an understanding as to specific kind of mechanisms by which glycans function. So just kind of in the broad sense, um, if we're kind of looking at, uh, I just have this cartoon depiction here, of some cell surface glycans. Um, many of the times the way that some sort of biological function is instigated is by interacting with a glycan binding protein. protein. Um, these can be from cell surface lectin molecules like selectins or other cell surface lectins. Um, these interactions can then maybe potentially trigger or initiate a signaling response. Sometimes they may um, inhibit a signaling response. They can be interactions between two different cells or interactions on the same cell. Um, and on top of this, um, in addition to kind of interacting with um, a, additional kind of cells, say, found within tissue, uh, cell surface glycans are also critical um, for, say, pathogen recognition. Um, the keys example are viruses, for instance, the flu virus, right, which recognizes um, sialylated glycans found on host cell surfaces. So there's like a wide range of function that's associated with, with cell surface glycans. Um, but kind of beyond understanding that and recognizing that these are important, um, we have a, a little bit of a limited understanding about um, direct exact mechanisms by which glycans um, elicit uh, their function. And so what I kind of mean by that, if we kind of break it down, is that we know that if we have a, gly a glycan binding protein can recognize some sort of glycan structure, maybe this will initiate some sort of, say, signaling cascade or inhibit a signaling cascade. Um, uh, some glycan binding proteins are um, kind of very promiscuous, I guess you could say, in terms of what they recognize. For instance, glycosaminoglycan binding proteins tend to recognize the highly anionic charges of glycosaminoglycans. So there's not a whole lot of, there, there may not be a whole lot of specificity associated with them, but there are a lot of glycan binding proteins that do have a specific kind of glycoform or substitution patterns of epitopes that they prefer to recognize. And this is becoming um, especially recently, kind of increasingly more recognized that there is a bit more of um, a specificity to what glycan binding proteins interact with. However, that kind of whole picture is not very well understood. And so um, what we're kind of interested in doing is, is developing chemical tools to kind of understand the role of the glycans, the glycoform 
uh, specifically are specific structures say needed for function or so not only interaction with the glycan binding protein but function and initially initiating signaling cascades but taking it kind of one step further how does like the role of the glycoconjugate play into um, biology of glycans because you can kind of envision that maybe um, some proteins are very specific to the glycans and the display of the epitopes on the glycans and maybe there is some sort of um, requirement for a specific conjugate, say a specific protein for which that glyco, that glycan is displayed on. However, this may also be very broad. Maybe this particular interaction would only want a, uh, it doesn't care what the glyco for, the glyco conjugate is, maybe it just likes the, the glycan structure. And so there's a lot of that detail that um, we are starting to kind of piece together and starting to understand, but much of this is not really well understood. And so this is kind of where my lab has been focusing on is developing tools so that we can start to probe and decouple these types of interactions. Now, I just wanted to kind of touch upon um, some key challenges in this area. Um, most of, of what we kind of uh, most of our understanding of, of glycan binding proteins and how glycans interact with proteins is limited to minimal epitopes. This is becoming a bit more expansive now as we're getting um, more uh, streamlined ways to synthesize complex glycans. But a lot of our information is kind of limited to minimal epitopes. Um, but there is, as I mentioned earlier, there is um, there is a bit of context dependency in terms of glycan binding proteins recognizing specific structure in that the display of this minimal epitope in a complex fashion can actually um, alter how that protein recognizes that sugar. And so our information has been a little bit limited to be able to decouple this. Um, a major challenge is that to be able to probe these uh, types of interactions, you need access to these compact, complex glycan structures, um, which say, for instance, in the end glycan, in an end glycan uh, is quite challenging to make. This has uh, been improved upon greatly, but this has been a large limitation. But another kind of area where I think there is um, a, a limitation of our understanding of the biology of glycans is that we don't really have the same, um, I guess, chemical biology or biochemical tools as we have for other biomolecules to study um, sp the specific, the function of specific glycans. So if we kind of think of traditional techniques that are used to say study the, the role or the function of proteins, um, we know that proteins are kind of encoded in our genome. They're encoded in a gene in our DNA. This can get transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein. And so we can, we have a template that we can go back to. We can do genetic manipulation. We can knock out that protein, see the effect. We can upregulate that protein and see the effect. Um, there is a template that we can go back to to start to modulate that particular biomolecule. In contrast, we don't really have that same luxury with glycans and glycan biosynthesis. Glycans are biosynthesized using kind of the, the action of glycosyl transferases, which these are enzymes. These enzymes are definitely encoded in the genome, but the particular structures that then get installed um, on say a particular uh, amino acid residue wherever the glycosylation is occurring, there isn't really a template to dictate what structure goes on at that position. And so while we can say use genetic tools to maybe knock out or upregulate certain glycosyl transferases, this can pose a bit of a challenge because that specificity in getting a defined structure is really challenging. Many glycosyl transferases um, are kind of more broadly acting. I'm just going to use the example of this galactosal transferase here. It can work on N-glycans. It can work on O-glycans. It is really difficult to, say, get to a particular O-glycan structure and say, this is how uh, it um, triggers some sort of biology within a cell. So um, this is kind of where we're wanting to develop some tools to start to tease apart some of these more kind of specific um, glycan and epitope interactions. Now, um, another challenge with um, particularly studying glycan protein interactions is that they're often transient and low affinity. On a cell surface, this is kind of compensated for by multivalent effects, um, but it is really challenging to isolate these interaction complexes. And so um, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Jennifer Kohler gave a fantastic talk on her 
um, her lab's use of photo cross-linking sugars. Um, and, and this is really, I think, an, an elegant way to get around this low affinity problem, because if you use some sort of group that can be activated selectively, say, by UV irradiation, um, in this instance, these are diacerine crosslinkers that the Kohler group uses. You form a high energy carbene intermediate. And then if you have a, a say a glycan binding protein that is binding to that particular sugar that now you have this high energy carbene intermediate, it's going to insert and form a covalent bond. And you get this kind of covalent adduct of the glycan connected to its glycan binding protein. And so this is the way that um, the Kohler group and the Paulson group have started to um, to overcome some of these challenges of low affinity by forming these covalent complexes. Now, primarily this, um, this type of photo cross-linking sugars has been incorporated into cells, um, as uh, Dr. Kohler talked about a couple of weeks ago, by doing metabolic incorporation. So this is where <coughs> you feed um, a, an acetylated uh, kind of modified sugar mono, uh, monomer um, to cells. Uh, cells can uptake this molecule. They can cleave off the acetates using esterases. It gets incorporated. Uh, it gets, um, sorry, uh, the, in the case of mannose, it gets uh, transformed into a CMP sialic acid that has this uh, photo cross-linking functionality on it. And then it gets installed into glycans um, and, and, and then uh, uh, shuttled up to the cell surface so that the, the glycoforms that are present on the cell surface are displaying these photo cross-linking molecules. Um, and through this, they've demonstrated um, a number of ways to kind of cross-link and identify um, binding partners. And this is, um, I think, a really elegant approach um, using this metabolic incorporation of these cross-linking sugars. However, there are some limitations with metabolic incorporation. Um, one is that it can be very cell specific. Some cells can uptake um, these modified sugars very readily and incorporate them into their cell surface glycans very readily, but other cell lines are not so great at being able to do that. You're also very limited in terms of what you can stick at this position because the larger that you go, the less likely it's going to be tolerated by the cell metabolic machinery to then incorporate that probe onto cell surfaces. Um, and another challenge, and this is the area that we um, are hoping to address with some of the tools that, that we're um, developing um, in these proof of concept works, is that um, with metabolic incorporation, it is really difficult to target a specific glycoform or specific glycan class. So for instance, if you're feeding cells with this um, mannose derivative, this man uh, NAC derivative with a photo crosslinker, it's very likely that this is going to get incorporated into various different glycoproteins on both N and O glycans, uh, glycolipids. Um, there's no real way to kind of control if you are installing it in an alpha 2-3 linkage versus an alpha 2-6 linkage versus potentially an alpha 2-8 linkage. You don't really have that same um, control of specificity to target a particular, say, glycan class to then pull apart what's important in those informations, uh, important in those interactions. And so kind of taking that in mind um, and then taking um, uh, what a project that I did as, my, as a postdoc uh, in uh, Kurtan Boone's lab, um, we wanted to kind of develop tools to do kind of glycan remodeling or glycoengineering using um, uh, and harnessing the specificity of sial transferases. So where this kind of idea came from, and this is just one example um, this is uh, th uh, a tool that I helped develop where we used kind of sialotransferases and modified CMP um, sialic acid sugars, where we could conjugate at the C5 position um, kind of a bifunctional entity where we had a biotin handle for labeling and then this complex functionalized synthetic glycan. And we targeted the C5 position because this position for most sialotransferases is solvent exposed. So we can essentially stick anything that we want at this position and this molecule will still be recognized by sialotransferases. And so um, I'm not gonna get into this work, but um, basically what we were able to demonstrate was that in kind of a one pot approach using this modified CMP sialic acid um, with a concurrent treatment of a sialidase to chew off sialic acids, and then using the sialotransferase ST6GAL1, we could install these bifunctional molecules onto cell surfaces and then carry that on forward to look at functionality of this defined glycan. We could probe for this biotin handle. So that kind of um, 
spawned me into thinking, well, can we use this as a tool, say, for these photo cross-linking derivatives and maybe harness the specificity of transferases to install these small linkered probes selectively onto cell surfaces? And so this um, has uh, been done not with photo, not with the diazering photo crosslinkers before, but with kind of simple azide modified CMP sialic acids um, in what we call a two step approach. These have an azide uh, functionality at the C9 position of CMP sialic acid. And so what's been demonstrated by the, um, the Steet, Wells and Boone's group is that they can kind of target specificity based on the enzyme that they use for this remodeling strategy. So again, if you cleave off all of the sialic acids off the native cell surface, you have these kind of LACNAC capped uh, glycoforms on the cell surface. If you take the CMP sialic acid and use the enzyme ST6Cal1 and subsequently then click with a strained alkyne to install a biotin functionality, you can selectively label only N-glycans with an alpha-2,6 link sialocyte. Conversely, if you use ST3Cal1, which is specific for O-glycans, you can selectively label or biotinylate only O-glycans. And so kind of taking this these kind of strategies in mind, what we wanted to then kind of embark upon is, can we use this as um, a tool to selectively install these diazerine photo crosslinkers so that we can start to maybe capture and probe um, glycan protein interactions in a cell-based environment? So this is kind of the a general um, uh, scheme of the selective glycan remodeling with diazerine probes. We have, we can synthesize this CMP um, sialic acid that has this small diazerine uh, moiety on it. And then we can harness the specificities of enzymes like ST6Gal1 to selectively install this probe on N-glycans, uh, maybe use ST3Gal1 to install this on O-glycans. And then we can probably we can install kind of more of a broad approach using ST three Gal four, which, um, as as best to our recollect or like our best to our knowledge, um, we think will cap off both O glycans and N glycans with um, a, a two three linked sialocyte and install that cross linker on all of these glycoforms. So this is kind of what we started to embark upon is seeing if um, the, the feasibility of using these probes to selectively. Um, install uh, these sialic acid probes on cell surfaces and then probe uh, glycan protein interactions. So um, this is work that's been conducted by um, my now graduate student, Jack Babulik, who he started with me as an undergrad. So the first step of this is to synthesize the um, CMP, the sialic acid probe. Um, this is fairly straightforward chemistry. It's starting just with a levulinic acid, um, installing, uh, making the imine with ammonia, then uh, using hydroxylamine sulfonic acid to give the diazeridine, and then upon um, Subjecting this to iodine, you get, get the diazerine functionality. Um, and then this uh, small kind of diazerine acid probe can be easily conjugated to um, mannose here. And I realize that I have the correct and the incorrect anamor of mannose. I apologize for the chemists out there. Um, but we can easily connect this through kind of straight amide bond coupling to get this mandaz derivative. And then we can use enzymes to um, convert the mandaz into the CMP sialic acid uh, derivative. First by, uh, this is all done in a one pot approach by using the aldolase to convert the, the mannose, mannose derivative to the sialic acid, and then using the, the uh, CMP sialic acid synthetase to install the, the CMP uh, sugar nucleotide. So this all can occur um, on quite a large scale. I think Jack does this on 100 MIG scale uh, fairly regularly. Um, we isolate after a couple of purifications um, by size exclusion um, to get this probe uh, in hand in decent quantities. So the first step um, that we did in the lab was um, test the substrates, the substrate specificity with the enzymes just in solution using a very simple kind of LACNAC uh, derivative. So this is just a linkered LACNAC. Um, one of the reasons why, and this is, again, there, there's no surprise that this is, these are able to selectively or, or successfully install these sialic acids onto the LACNAC, but this kind of served as a tool for us because we express all of these enzymes in-house. Um, we use um, Kelly Mormon's constructs um, where these are conjugated to GFP proteins through um, 
a TED linker. Um, and so this was a bit of something to get established in our lab. And as a new group, it was really important since we use so many enzymes for, for everything that we kind of do in the lab to ensure that we, we had a way to test that our enzymes that we were expressing were active. So um, not surprising that, that th these are tolerated by both of these enzymes, but also uh, great to see that the enzymes that we express are definitely active. So kind of after all of this, the synthesis and testing of the, um, of the enzymes was done. Next, we kind of moved to um, applying this onto cell surfaces. And one of the targets that we are interested in is looking at SIGLEX and interaction with SIGLEX. So SIGLEX are the sialic acid binding immunoglobulin type lectins. Um, there's a family of 15 of them um, in humans or in mammals. Um, and these are um, immunomodulatory receptors that are found on various immune cells. Um, they bind to sialylated glycans with each kind of SIGLEC um, having its own, uh, I'm going to say quote unquote specificity. Some of them are a bit more broadly tolerable for certain sialic acid linkages, whereas others are more specific. Um, but we're really interested in trying to uncover kind of some of the, the unknown biology and unknown um, bind, glycan binding partners for these really important immunoregulatory uh, molecules. And Another reason why we were interested in SIGLEX is because we could, um, we could start with a proof of concept with a more well-studied SIGLEX like CD22 um, as kind of a, a starting point to ensure that we were getting kind of the cross-linking chemistry and everything in hand before moving on to something that is a bit less known. So it gave us a tool for a proof of concept. And that's what I'm gonna kind of talk about for the rest of my talk. And so um, doing uh, cross-linking chemistry with CD22 isn't really new. Um, as I mentioned, Jennifer Kohler's group has done this with metabolic incorporation. Um, so has Jim Paulson's group. Um, uh, the Kohler lab uh, primarily uses this um, diazerine linked uh, substrate, whereas the Paulson group has reported using aryl azides at the C9 position. And so through this type of kind of chemistry or uh, chemical biology, they've been able to demonstrate um, cis cross-linking. So cis interactions on the same cell where CD22 um, can interact with glycoproteins on, its, uh, on the same cell and CD22 uh, in cis interacts with itself as CD22. Um, but there's also trans interactions that can occur. Um, and uh, while primarily these have been done by metabolic incorporation, um, the Paulson lab did report using ST6-GAL1 to modify cell surfaces with their aryl azide cross-linking derivative to capture trans interactions. But to the best of our knowledge, um, the um, applicability of these CMP sialic acid with, with the diazerine has not been done in kind of a glycan remodeling strategy um, as of yet. And um, Beyond kind of using ST6-GAL1, as, as again, to the best of our knowledge, we haven't seen an example where other sialotransferases have been used in this type of remodeling strategy um, and cross-linking strategy. So the first step that we did was, again, because we're working with CD22, this is a, a CD22 is primarily found, or it's found uh, on B cells. So we took a B cell line of Raji cells. And our first step was taking our photo cross-linking probe and just first demonstrating that indeed we are getting it onto cell surfaces. And so we probed with the lectin SNA, which specifically recognizes two six sialoglycans. So we have the control cells here in blue probe by flow cytometry. So they bind quite robustly to SNA. When we treat with neuraminidase, uh, we lose those sialylated uh, epitopes that uh, SNA recognizes. And so we see a, a decrease in the, the shift in the flow cytometry uh, plot. And then when we reinstall these onto cells, we then see again, it, back an increase in SNA binding, indicating that we're installing that probe onto the cell surfaces. So this was great. Um, so next we then moved on to looking at um, kind of a recombinant soluble CD22. Um, and this was, uh, these were provided to us from the Macaulay group. So this has been a really a nice collaboration with a nice, another Glyconet investigator. Um, and so uh, this has taken a, a bit of, bit of, a bit of optimization, um, but again, demonstrating the same, uh, the same concepts that I went through with the SNA. We have the control cells, they bind to this soluble CD22. When we treat them with neuraminidase, we see a decrease in CD22 binding as expected. And then as we remodel with our CMP sialic acid diazerine, we then see a reinstallation of binding to CD22. 
And then we also kind of repeated these experiments. We looked at the R120A mutant that, um, that the Macaulay group also has, which this, uh, this um, mutation from the arginine um, to the alanine completely abolishes recognition by sialic acids. And as expected, even after our remodeling, and we have all of the controls for this as well, even after remodeling, we don't see any binding by flow cytometry to this uh, R120A mutant. So then the next step was, okay, can we see cross-linking um, in trans with a recombinant CD22 protein? Um, and so the, the setup of the experiment is all the same. We treat with neuraminidase, add, use st 6 gal one add in our diazerine probe, bind with CD22, irradiate with um, UV light at 365 nanometers. And then hopefully we have these covalent constructs, uh, these covalent uh, captured interactions in trans. And so in this, uh, we repeated this a few times, uh, except for this R120A mutant. This is kind of hot off the press data, literally about 10 minutes before I um, jumped on to, to give this talk. Um, so what we find is that when we, uh, when we bind our glyco-engineered cells, so these are the ones that have the diazerine cross-linker on it that has been installed with ST6GAL1, you can see here that we see kind of more, a much more darker bands of higher molecular weights um, for this kind of for the UV positive control, indicating that um, we can we're starting to see cross-linking to this um, to this soluble SIGLEC um, in comparison to kind of our negative UV control here. And this control over here is glycoengineered cells plus and minus UV. So they have our diazerine crosslinker. And this serves as a control to see are the interactions that we're seeing cis, linkage, cis crosslinking or are they because of the trans crosslinking? And so here we then did crosslinking with the R120A mutant. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, we saw no crosslinking bands indicating that this mutant is unable to bind to our glycoengineered cells, and we are not seeing crosslinking with this uh, with this mutant with our engineered cells. So this was um, pretty exciting to be able to see. It, it's been a bit of a, an uphill battle, compounded by you know limitations with COVID, but um, pretty exciting that we were able to start to see some kind of hints of crosslinking using these trans interactions. Um, and so kind of our, our next step is to uh, hopefully then start to look at different cell transferases. So preliminarily, what we've done so far is again, looking at SNA binding. Um, and, and we've done the appropriate controls to, to, um, to counter this. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but here's the ST6GAL1 data, right? Control cells, neuraminidase treated, reduce SNA binding, reinstallation of the 2,6-link sialic acid, we see an uh, increase in binding with SNA. When we do the same set of reactions with the ST3, um, we see very, just a very minor shift um, in the positive for the SNA binding, which is um, not surprising because SNA uh, binds to alpha 2,6 link sialoglycans, and we're installing these here with a 2,3 linkage. So not, no recognition by the SNA. And we've done controls looking at um, LACNAC binding lectins where we see kind of the opposite effect. So we know that we're putting this onto cells, um, but we're not putting it on with a 2,6 linkage. And again, did the same types of steps uh, looking at CD22 binding. This is just a refresher of what the flow graphs look like with um, CD22. And unsurprisingly, when we do the same uh, experiments with ST3GAL4, we see CD22 binding of our control cells. Neuraminidase, that binding is decreased. And we do not see any interaction with the CD22 of our ST3GAL4 remodeled glycans. So this is, again, preliminary um, interactions. Next step is to do some kind of trans, uh, sorry, trans cross-linking with ST3GAL4 re remodeled cells. Um, and then we want to explore other silo transferases with this to ensure that our kind of selective remodeling is actually selective in terms of cross-linking. Now, just really quickly, I wanted to touch upon, we're also interested in trying to use these tools these glycoengineering strategies to look at cis crosslinked complexes. And we have preliminary, pre preliminarily looked at this, again, very, very preliminary. Um, we remodeled the cells. We allowed um, the cells to incubate for three hours to try to reform these um, cis uh, complexes. So we do see a little bit of crosslinking, uh, indicating that there is cis crosslinking occurring uh, with our glyco or glyco remodeled cells. 
However, so far comparing this to metabolic incorporation, this is the one of the figures from the Kohler Group's paper. Um, we're, we're not quite at the right stage yet. We have a lot more optimizing to do, but it's promising that we're seeing cross-linking and we just need to find the right balance to let those cis interactions occur so that we can selectively start to probe um, cis interactions using this glycan remodeling strategy as well. And so that's kind of our next steps for this project here. So um, with that, I just kind of wanted to, to end there um, some kind of preliminary idea of proof of concept works where um, we're using these kind of uh, CMP sialic acid diazering photo crosslinkers um, with the aim to selectively install these sialic acids onto with specific linkages and harnessing the specificity of sialotransferases to install them onto certain classes of glycans to allow us to probe glycan uh, protein interactions, and then allow us to do some cross-linking experiments with the overall goal to um, uh, kind of do immunoprecipitation and proteomics analysis to try to uncover what these conjugates are through the selective remodeling approach. Um, and so kind of future work with this is looking at other silotransferases. We have a panel of two, three um, of ST3s, ST6s, um, ST8s, we have a number of ST8s that we've expressed. And so we're just trying to expand upon this toolbox um, in the near future. Um, and then we want to use this to help capture both cis and trans interactions, again, after some optimizing, um, not only with CD22, but we want to explore other SIGLEX as well um, in co collaboration with uh, the Macaulay group, which is a really nice complement, um, I think, between kind of our two groups and our two expertise. Um, and so with that, I have to give a tremendous thank to my graduate student, Jack Babulik, who uh, has really um, taken this project and run with it um, and has done some excellent work starting as an undergrad. I'm very fortunate to have him in my lab. Um, and we've had a number of students kind of help us out with this. Um, undergraduate Rebecca Tien and Sophie Emberly Corkmas, who was a Glyconet summer um, undergraduate student. Um, and then, of course, collaborators, uh, Matt McCauley and uh, his students, Emily and Kelly, who have been providing us with some of these SIG-like tools for analysis. And thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions if we have, uh, if we have some time. <laughs>